Thank you. Welcome to my session. My name is... It's, it actually, it sounds much better in Russian than in Romanian. In Romanian, it says Konzan. You have the T sound in Russian. Yeah, you have it. So it's Konzan. Um, <coughs> my first time here in Moscow, my grandparents visited Moscow a long time ago. So every two generations, apparently, in my family, somebody comes and visits Moscow. A um, few things about me before getting started with the REST API testing. I've been in testing for 12 years. Um, I'm currently working as a test architect and I'm doing consultancy so for, for various companies as a test architect. I'm also a triathlete, so if there are any Ironmans in the room, triathletes in the room, nobody. Yeah, here's two, actually, yes. Well, that's the moment when a triathlete sta stares at a spinning wheel and thinks about how to test REST APIs. Yeah, so that's my moment of inspiration for all my presentations. I'm also a PhD student, worst decision I have ever made, still struggling with it. And I'm also founder of the Smart Testing Services. This is something that we think that every software deserves a smart testing approach. So we're trying to provide that through our services. Now, <clears throat> there's a story behind this presentation about the REST APIs. Um, a couple of years ago, I decided to join a different company, a consultancy-based company. And my first project was about providing a testing strategy for a large bank in Netherlands. And I failed. I failed because for me, REST API was only an HTTP request to a server with a response. And we failed because there were so many defects in production that we just lost the contract. So it was a, not the very good start of, uh, in the company. In parallel to that, I started my PhD. Yeah, it was a, not a very good moment in my life. Um, so starting my PhD, I started uh, seeing what the research is doing in the area of software testing. And I found out about a guy which is Roy Thomas Fielding, and he's the REST inventor. Actually, REST, REST services and the, cons, the entire concept of REST, it's, it's his work, it's, it is his PhD work in the area of software development and software engineering. So I read about his book, I read about his paper, and I read about his blog. And two years ago, he, read, he wrote on his blog is, is, is there something broken with the REST API concept? Where did I fail? Because apparently people misunderstand and misunderstood the concept of REST and what RESTful means, just like I did. It's not just an HTTP call, it's more than that. So I Googled a couple of days ago and apparently REST API, it's a trend already and it's growing. And this screenshot was taken like three or four days ago from the Google Trends about the REST API. So there's a high, pretty high interest in the concept and how it uh, should be used. More, this is a picture I took on the airplane coming here to Moscow. What is the future of programming? That's the Romanian version of the same text. And what it says there, it says, um, that it's, it's a fascinating field in the Internet of Things, which connects devices that we have contact with every day. Smartwatch, smartphones, tablets. In engineering terms, REST is a beloved profession for simplicity, it's fluid, and an extremely permissible architecture. So, if at one point, you'll get a notification on your mobile phone that your food in the fridge will expire. That's because there's a REST API behind that which supports the entire functionality. 
So REST API is going to be the next, next big thing which will support the Internet of Things. So is this just another presentation about REST? I hope not. I hope you, at the end of the presentation you'll know more about what REST is and you'll know about how to approach REST testing. Because just like I did, and I, I had the experience, internet is full of articles about REST. But the problem with the internet, nobody really reviews and tells you whether it's true or not. You really have to decide it on your own. So what actually mean REST means? So REST, it's an architectural style. Right? REST, it's a guideline, just like testing. Nobody tells you how to do testing specifically. There are no rules, there are no standards. There are, but we're actually fighting against them. So REST, for me, and for the creator of it, it's a set of guidelines. In order to be able to have a RESTful application, you need to follow those guidelines. So, they also call it constraints, but I think we should be more optimistic, and let's go with the word as a guideline. So, we call it RESTful. Appli an application is RESTful when you meet all those five, and you'll see them, five guidelines. One, we have to have a uniform interface. What does that mean? That for each interaction with my application, there's, an only, there's one way of doing it, and I'll find it across the entire application. Next, we have a client and a server, a communication between two parties. Client being a different application, being a smartphone application, a tablet, a web one. And the server, something that processes data that delivers a response upon, on a request, stateless. What does stateless mean? It doesn't have any state. If I'm making the same request over and over again on a server, I get the same response. Stateful, think about long-running jobs, that which can be starting, pending, running, finishing, finished. That's a state. With REST, we don't have that. Cache, where do we keep that data which, are, which is very easily retrieved from the server and it gives us also a lot of pain because we forget or the developers forget to update. And we get, we have new data in, uh, in the database but we retrieve data from cache and there are differences. And there's a layered system, just like onions. Onions have layers, that's what Shrek said. So there's a layer of a data access layer, there's a business layer, there's a presentation layer. How many of you know or how many of you ask on your project about the architecture diagram? Okay, a few. Were you able to identify based on the architecture whether uh, there is or there is not an API behind? Yeah. Not that many. Okay, so here's how an architecture with an API or without an API looks like, just to spot the difference. We have a layered system. Everything is centralized towards a business logic, which is supported by that API. API means application programming interface. So a RESTful API means that our interface it's compliant with the guidelines of REST. What REST is not? REST is not a protocol. SOAP is a protocol. And like any other Microsoft-based products, it's very hard to use. REST is not an API itself. REST, it's a guideline. Right? It can be applied over an API, but it's not specific. We call REST API, but REST can be more than that. REST is not HTTP, just like I failed in my former project. And REST is not just a client. We have clients and tools which enable us to use and interact with REST APIs. 
and you, we will not find them everywhere. And having REST doesn't mean you have the magic solution. There are also applications which use SOAP, and they do it successfully. For example, banks are using SOAP a lot because for their specific context, it works much better than the SOAP, than the REST, sorry. So, at the basics of the REST, it stands hyp it's hypermedia. Without the hypermedia, REST cannot exist. What is hypermedia is the core concept of the World Wide Web. And within hypermedia, we have text, pictures, videos, links. Everything that you can find in the World Wide Web is hypermedia. Without it, there's no web. Without web, there's no API. So, whenever you find an application which ba is based on REST, there are a couple of benefits which are identified and are identified by as a REST architectural goal. So, whenever your application uses REST, these are some quality attributes that you need to um, check whether they comply with or not. And part of the quality attributes can be performance, scalability, simplicity, easy to modify, it's visible, I can see the communication between the, uh, my client and my server. It's portable, it can be deployed anywhere in any environment, and it's reliable. If I'm doing the same thing a hundred times, I need to have the same response. So, we're not using REST as an H we're not calling REST API as an HTTP thing. The correct um, specification is we're using REST API over an HTTP protocol. So, from now on, we will refer to REST API as operations and requests made through an HTTP protocol. We can also do it uh, via TCP IP, but that's not really Internet of Things. And my experience is mostly related to um, web, uh, web applications, and that's why we're focusing at the moment on HTTP. So who uses REST? Mostly everybody uses REST. Because if you want to be relevant on the market, you have to be fast, you have to be portable, you have to be performant, you have to be secured. You have to have all those quality attributes that the REST provides you and assures you. So we have Twitter, we have Facebook. We have LinkedIn, trust me, at least LinkedIn has API. Google, anybody has, has APIs. So this is a print screen of uh, Trello. I, we've used it yesterday. You don't really have to see what's in, written in there. But I want to emphasize the role of the visibility such that if I want to know what happens and what's the communication between my client and my server, I am able to see that via my browser console. And I see there everything that happens. I want you to think of the API as some string puppets. And these are the string puppets, right? And for the string puppets, you have a master puppet which creates them. Think of him as the architect. Geppetto, right? Pinocchio, Geppetto is the architect of Pinocchio. He followed some guidelines such that he knows he has to use some strings. He has that cross uh, wooden plates that he used to control. Those are his guidelines. And the outcome of that, it's a behavior. Now, the HTTP call in our situation are those strings. My question for you is, in our case, because this is a very technical approach, who is our client in, our, in this case? There, are, there was a previous presentation here about UAT. Who do we UAT for when we talk about REST API? Any thoughts? Uh, 
Okay. The client is my fellow developer, web developer, who's going to use my REST API in order to deliver for you, the end client, a beautiful experience. These are my web developers, which are, are using um, my REST API and everything that I have built in order to create a beautiful experience and, prov and provide you with the needs and the business needs that you need. So whenever you think about REST API and who do you uh, deliver this application, think of it as web developers, other technical people. This is the template for the for a REST over HTTP. It has a protocol, which can be HTTP or HTTPS. It has a URL and a port. There's a resource. There's a question mark, which is very important. And there are some query parameters. And this is an example of how, that, how it happens. So whenever I click, there's a site which is called randomuser.me. I use it for test data. It creates random people. So whenever I click generate persona, there's a API call H over HTTP, which will generate me a persona mail from nationality GB. I have the protocol. I have the URL. I have the resource. I have the question mark and the query parameters. And the query parameters are delimited by an end sign. So I have the strings, but I need to tell them what to do. Pull, push, shake. How does it happen? So my HTTP protocol enables me to have verbs. They're also known as crude operations. Crude from create, read, update, and delete. We have for create, we have post, get, put, and delete. And we have the Maslow's pyramid of needs. That teams, they don't need, just need to look at the, at, at the APIs as one single point of contact and see them as a singularity and only the methods. They need to think as a solution. They need to think business. They need to enable other web developers or mobile developers to provide a consistent experience. So if I want to have a user management website, I can have create update and retrieve data, but I also need to delete. And I, want, I also need to be able to create a solution between all four. If I'm doing that on the, at the UI level using Selenium, it's an option, but it's not the best option. It's not the only option. If I do it at the API level, it's much more reliable and it's not dependent on the client that we use. By client, I mean mobile, tablet, browser, whichever it is. So behavioral and we think solution. Now, we have the testing pyramid. Are you aware of that? Do you know it? See it? Yeah. Do you use it? Do you know the, that the testing pyramid, it's a theoretical thing, never proven correct in practice? It was proven that doesn't prove anything. It's just a theoretical model. And I don't like it. And most of the companies say, OK, when we talk about REST API, we talk about service layers. It's OK. It's true, because through the REST API, we provide a service. But whenever you think of your testing strategy, if you rely on this testing pyramid, you might actually fail, because there are no hard, consisting data to prove it that it will work. And I suggest you another, uh, another approach, which was actually um, proposed by Joe Colantino to use testing scales. Stop thinking about testing levels, unit system acceptance, and think about how are you going to write the tests for a specific functionality, and then put everything together and see whether it's going to 
look like a pyramid or not. So for a login functionality, try and see what's the best option and how much time you'd like to invest on the REST API part, on the UI part, or on the backend with the unit testing. So each time you, you shift the entire process, you look more into how can I achieve my objective with what tools. Also REST API is very, very common and consistent within the microservices world. And microservices, everybody's moving now th to microservices from monolithic architectures to th something smaller, which provides you with the, the data and with the needs, with the business needs. And they introduce in between the contractual API testing. What does that mean? is that once I know the behavior, once I know that one single operation is working, I want to know whether a contract between two operations of two different services can talk to each other. That would be a cron contract. In order for the two of us, me as a speaker, you as the audience, to be able to understand each other, we need to share a contract. In my case, the contract is the language. And we have some help or we just speak plain English. That's the contract. Then we need to go on the solution part and think of the application of, of the entire solution. End-to-end -end tests. Is my web developer available with the API that I provide to offer to my end user um, a consistent and complete approach functionality? Let's try an example. I have here, I, I need two volunteers. Anybody wants, between the two I, that I already agreed in as a backup, I need two volunteers. Anybody, come on. You're waste, it's part of the time of the event. No? Okay, I have one in the back. One more, come on, please. Okay, come. What's your name? Gary. Andre. 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 Anastasia. Anastasia. Okay, Andre. So, I want to make an example of what behavioral contract and solution based testing means. Okay? And we're going to play a game which is clapping hands. Okay? You can do that, right? Now, here's my example. Can you do that? Now you have to try that. Don't worry, I'll help you. So, behavioral means that each one of him can either clap, raise their hands, cross on their chest, slap on their feet, right? So, just do it individually because it's contract, yeah, right? It's behavioral. I want to be able to know whether each one of them can operate those single things. You can try. Okay. Cool. Works, right? Now, contract what does contractual mean? I want to know whether her actions will meet his actions. That meaning that they their hands need to inter to clap each other, right? So let's try this together. Yeah, okay, contractual, so they've met, right? Now, that's the hard part. Uh-oh, we have a solution. And from the solution perspective, we don't mean that we, they have to complete the entire game, but they also need to be performant, entertainment, scalable, fast, and deliver the outcome as a REST service, right? So. Let's try to do it as a solution, end-to-end, -end, right? Play it just like you've seen it there. Try it. One, two, 
three, four, five, six. Four. That's a bug. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, you have to think gradually, right? You have to think from the uh, units, which is your method, your HTTP request, up to what the output of one does as an input for the other, and how they together provide you with the solution-based approach. Familiar with the San Francisco Depot approach? I use it very often. And I use it, San Francisco Depot, it's a way of documenting your testing approach. Each letter means something. Structure, functions, data, interfaces. I'm not going to go on each one of them. James Bach, Michael Bolton defined the approach. It's very useful. Google it and start using it. I use it to, in order to define the REST API testing approach. You don't have to know what's in there, but it's a visual way of explaining people what are you going to test and how. And the structure of the San Francisco Depot offers you a consistent way, a clear way of doing it. So, for example, when I'm talking about functions, I structure my functions based on types of operations, whether there's a patch put, a get, a post, a delete, and then I structure everything so I know how to approach. It's a living documentation. I can share it across teams. For example, and then once I know what are my operations, I just write them, what I'm going to do with them. From a solution perspective, I want to check for invalid data, check the authorization, check for duplicate data. What if I'm doing the same post twice, what, how the server will respond to that. So you know about the REST, you know about RESTful, you know about HTTP, you know about APIs, you need a tool for that. And it proved that, I just read, uh, a couple of days ago, that mnemonics, these are some mnemonics, like a debut, they're not the best way of keeping in mind things. Actually, they're the worst. But it just makes you look smarter. So, you know, when I'm choosing the, uh, the right tool or a tool for my uh, API testing, I use those guidelines. And those are some of the things that I do. Data-driven support, I think, is very important. Running the same approach same method with different sets of data. Being user-friendly, technology agnostic, meaning that I can use it, Postman is technology agnostic. I can use it with Java API implementation, .NET API implementation, it doesn't matter. Some tools available, there are plenty of them. And I, I think that the number of tools really reflects the importance of the REST API. That's mostly because while for the web, there are only a couple, and Selenium being the most popular one, there are many, many other tools for the REST API, and I think that uh, reflects the importance of it. So, if you need to know how to test it, you really need, again, mnemonics. First, you need to know your API. Then you need to be able to identify the parameters that you're going to use. Remember those query parameters? Look at the API as a product. Look for endpoints. What are the endpoints? And identify types of the operations. What is supported? Am I supporting the all four? Only three of them. There are many more. And you have to test it thoroughly because I'm teaching you about the guidelines of the rest but you are the expert in testing and you need to know how to apply the right testing techniques in order to meet the demands of your business and of your application. So, some testing techniques that you could use is test for error handling, error codes, just to see what are the content times and the data types supported, check for data validation, security, it's very important, skills. I think 
uh, I was intrigued um, the other week. I had a meeting with, I had an interview with a junior. He said he's, he wants to join the IT world by having a testing career because his friend said that it's the easiest way of getting into the IT. So I was intrigued because there are a lot of skills required to be a good tester. And apart from the technical skills, you also need to have a communication skills. You need to be able to know about the architecture. You perhaps you need to know about programming. Perhaps you need to know about business. You need to have a lot of skills. And if you're not talking about skills, whenever we're talking about a technical concept like REST, I think we're missing the point. So, in summary, please be aware that REST is an architectural style and it's a guideline. Make use of the paper. The PhD dissertation of the REST, it's available online and it's free. Be aware of the benefits of REST. It's are on the slides. I think you'll also have the slides. It's also available on Google results. So have in consideration the Maslow pyramid because you have to go through the behavioral upwards to the solution. If you're going to use the Kirit and the debut mnemonics, that's fine. I'm sure there are all others, but it's something that can get you started whenever you need. And don't forget about the skills. Whenever you promote the concept of REST API and the testing the REST API, be sure to promote how important are your skills and your testing skills and knowledge in order to successfully deliver the results. Thank you.